this national park is named after a pirate. Now, if you were to ask this pirate if he was a pirate, he would say, no, I'm not a pirate. But indeed, he was a pirate. That pirate lends his name to the Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve. Located in Louisiana, this park encompasses six different locations spread across the southern portion of the state. Three of these locations are dedicated to interpreting the region's rich Cajun culture and history. You've got the Acadian Cultural Center in Lafayette, the Prairie Acadian Cultural Center in Eunice, and the Wetlands Acadian Cultural Center in Thibodeau. Each of these units helps tell the story of the Acadians, who would later become Cajuns. They were originally from France, but came to settle in what is today Nova Scotia, Canada. Facing persecution and forced eviction from their homes, they would eventually come to settle in southern Louisiana, creating the diverse and vibrant culture we know about today. The other three units of Jean Lafitte are located closer to the city of New Orleans, one of the biggest and most important port cities on the Mississippi River. First, you've got a downtown visitor center in the French Quarter. This location interprets the long and storied history of New Orleans itself. Then, just southeast of there, you've got the Chalmette Battlefield, which preserves the main location where the Battle of New Orleans took place during the War of 1812. This area actually has a long history of preservation, as efforts to protect the battlefield can be traced back to the mid-1800s, just a few decades after the battle itself took place. Eventually, it was protected by the United States Department of War, aka the Department of Defense, but would be transferred to the National Park Service in 1933 and redesignated as its own National Historical Park in 1939. When the Jean Lafitte Park was created in 1978, Chalmette was made one of the six units of that park. And finally, the main thrust of the Jean Lafitte National Historical Park can be found in the Barataria unit south of New Orleans. This is the place where efforts to create a Jean Lafitte Park were really centered. The Barataria Preserve protects 26,000 acres of Louisiana wetlands, where you can find an excellent example of the ecological community in this area. There are cypress swamps, bayous, and marshes, you'll find alligators, turtles, so many birds, and plenty of snakes as well. And I'm sure you'll be unsurprised to learn that this area was under threat, and that those threats culminated in the effort to protect it as a national park. See, after World War II, New Orleans, like many places in America, was growing rapidly. The types of habitats that Barataria protects today, these swampy wetland habitats, were the target of many a land developer. They wanted to drain these wetlands and put suburban housing on them. Canals were also being carved through these areas to make way for oil and gas exploration, as well as commercial shipping lanes. Frank J. Errett was the man leading the preservation campaign in those early days. He recognized how important these wetlands were for the area, especially for protection from things like hurricanes. He talked to just about anyone who would listen and gave presentations highlighting these issues. Eventually, these efforts culminated in the creation of a Jean Lafitte State Park in 1966. But uh, the Louisiana State Legislature didn't appropriate any funds for the park, and parks need money, so the park wasn't built. This didn't stop the park's proponents, however. They were like, fine, we want a national park then. So they focused their efforts on that. Now, to get a national park here, it was going to take a lot more than just protecting Louisiana wetlands. They're important, no doubt, but to create a national park, you have to have national significance. So they go through this process of developing a feasibility study and exploring all of their different options. And basically, they determined that Southern Louisiana itself is nationally significant. This was a place with incredibly diverse histories and cultures, and when combined with the original ecological significance, it meant there was no other place like it preserved by the National Park Service. You had a documented Native American presence here, you had Cajun culture, you had the history of New Orleans itself, you had military history, you had a threatened ecological area. All of these things combined to lend credibility to the creation of a new national park in southern Louisiana. The process wasn't without its difficulties, of course. Land management would be challenging, development activity threatened the park, and there was even a point when the park was caught in the middle of President Nixon's efforts to stop the Park Service from continuing to expand. But through all of it, a park emerged. The law creating it was signed in November of 1978. And linking all of it, all of these disparate histories and cultures and ecologies, was the pirate Jean Lafitte. It was his name attached to the park. So let's talk about this pirate. Let's talk about Jean Lafitte. 
because I find it so interesting that this park was named after him for a couple reasons. For one, he's a pirate, not exactly known as the most savory of historical figures. But more than that, what I find so fascinating is that we don't even know that much about him. How can we name a park after somebody we don't know that much about? We don't know when he was born or when he died. He was probably born in the 1780s and maybe died in the 1820s, but also maybe died in the 1850s? We don't know. We also don't know where he was born or where he died. Some reports place him being born in the Basque country of France, others in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, in what is now Haiti. I mean, that's like an entire ocean's difference. We simply don't know. We don't know if or when he was married or if or when he had children. One account says he had a relationship with his mistress, Catherine Villard, and had one child, a boy. Another account says he married a woman named Christina Levine and had three children, but Christina died in childbirth and after his children grew up, he married another woman and had two more children. We don't know. Heck, we don't even know how to spell his name. He probably spelled it with two F's and one T, but the accepted spelling today now has one F and two T's. So for all the things we don't know about Jean Lafitte, how did we come to have a national park named after him? Well, to understand that, let's talk about the things we do know about him. We do know that he was in New Orleans sometime around 1810 with his brother Pierre. He dealt in goods, but uh, not the legal kind. See, in 1807, the United States had passed something called the Embargo Act, which restricted trade between the US and other nations. The embargo didn't really have its intended effect and instead made things more difficult for American merchants. Lafitte seized on this hardship and began operating a successful smuggling business, if you want to call it that. Basically, he made it easier for merchants to purchase goods in a time when it was really difficult to obtain any goods. The people of New Orleans actually admired him for this. They had no skin in the game when it came to the Embargo Act and their livelihoods were being impeded. To them, Lafitte was just helping out. Obviously though, this was illegal, so Lafitte was breaking the law. His smuggling efforts weren't just limited to goods though, either. Around this same time, the importation of slaves to the United States was also banned, and to Lafitte, smuggling humans and smuggling goods were one and the same. It made him money, so he did it. But this isn't piracy though. It was illegal and morally reprehensible, yes, but not piracy. So how did he get that moniker? Well, by uh, doing pirate stuff. He raided ships, stole their cargo, and just generally terrorized the Caribbean coastline. Except if you asked Lafitte, he would tell you he was a privateer. Now, a privateer is sort of like a pirate, except you have permission from a government to do pirate stuff. You're basically a legal pirate. So that's what Lafitte would tell you he was doing, privateering. But he didn't really have permission from any recognized government, including the United States, to be a privateer. So he was a pirate. To manage all of this smuggling and pirate activity, Lafitte had based himself in an area called Barataria Bay at the farthest southern reaches of Louisiana. Barataria Bay was remote, it was swampy, it was dense and dark, and it made for the perfect location to fly under the radar and do smuggling and pirate stuff. Due to this location, Lafitte and his men, who probably totaled around a thousand people at this time, were known as the Baratarians. And they were garnering quite the reputation. Smuggling and pirate stuff don't fly under the radar for long. At one point, reportedly, the governor of Louisiana, William Claiborne, put out wanted posters and a $500 reward for Lafitte, only to find the next day that a $1,000 reward was being offered for the governor himself. Anyway, by this time, the War of 1812 was going on and the authorities were not happy with Lafitte's antics and illicit activities. The British, who were planning to attack New Orleans, sensed this and tried to enlist Lafitte's help in their attack. After all, he had a bunch of men and weapons that could be very useful. They offered him a bunch of money and a position in the Royal Navy for his services. But Lafitte then turns right around, tattles on the British to the Americans, and actually offers to help defend New Orleans in exchange for pardons for him and his men. The Americans don't go for it. They instead raid his camp and capture a bunch of his ships and men. But then, the British do attack New Orleans and it's not very well defended. So General Andrew Jackson relents and enlists the help of Jean Lafitte and his Baratarians. Together, they repel the British and emerge victorious at the Battle of New Orleans. Lafitte and his men receive their pardons. 
And this is where the mythology of Jean Lafitte really comes into its own. After this, he kind of just disappears again. He goes off and does some more pirate stuff in Galveston, Texas, is run out of there, maybe dies, maybe doesn't, who knows. But because of his involvement in the Battle of New Orleans, he went from a plundering pirate to a plundering patriot. His mysterious past and unknown whereabouts only continued to add to the legend of this man. See, when there's no real definitive historical record of you, your exploits become legendary, your actions become fabled, your status becomes mythical. I mean, just look at some of the modern pop culture references John Lafitte has inspired. There are two major motion pictures, both titled The Buccaneer, based on his life. One of them was directed by the legendary director Cecil B. DeMille. If you've ever been to Disneyland in California, the anchor in New Orleans Square supposedly belonged to his ship. The Jean Lafitte blacksmith shop in New Orleans, one of the oldest buildings in the city, supposedly belonged to him. There's even two towns named for him in southern Louisiana, the town of Jean Lafitte and the town of Lafitte. This man is even on a cereal box. The pirate Jean Lafoot from Cap'n Crunch is based on, of course, Jean Lafitte. So when we look at why we have a national park named after a pirate, smuggler, slave trader, war hero, I think we actually have to look at all the things we don't know about him. Those are the things that have allowed his past to be obscured and his legend to be amplified. We might never know these things about Jean Lafitte, and so he will remain mysterious and complicated and problematic and he will remain a pirate. If you like park stories like this one, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. It helps me bring these stories to more people and it helps to support my work. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.